Welcome to episode 179 of The Lab. I'm Brad Barton. And I'm Phil Barton. We do have some links on today's subject on the show page, which you can find by visiting thelabwithbrad.com. There's a lot of... This, I'm gonna, editing is going to take a little bit more effort because we're sick. But uh, <laughs> there are noises which you folk don't need to hear. Blowing noses. Blowing noises and coughing. coughing. Various bits of profanity. So, mm. the Triassic. Yes. Now, yes. Do, do we want to say Triassic or Triassic? I don't know. I heard it's like tomato, tomato, but I always hear Triassic, at least from Australian dudes out in the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere, both of them. All right, Triassic it is. So, the Triassic began 250 <laughs> million years ago. <laughs> That just happened. Yeah, Bye. that just happened. And uh lasted to about 200 million years ago. It lasted for uh, 50 to 52 million years. Started right after the biggest die-off in the history of history. Everybody died. Everybody died. And then nothing but dry, dry, dry. <laughs> By this time, all the continents had nestled up together into Pangea. Which is a beautiful term. Yeah, that's... Uh, you sent me a Sounds link about, uh, I think I actually made a link on the last show page where a guy was talking about the history of that theory. Yeah, the show kind of seemed like a uh, high school version, 101 on Continental Drift. Yeah, and uh, that guy, I can't remember his name, but his original theory was, hey, once upon a time, all the continents were stuck up together into one big thing. And he named it Pangea, meaning, meaning uh, the whole land. Since then, it turns out that continents actually drift around all over the place, and it has assembled into large conglomerations multiple times and then broken apart. During the Triassic, it was one big Pangaea, centered roughly on the equator. Uh, the southern end and northern end both reached the poles. However, it was much warmer, and there doesn't seem to have been any ice caps associated with sitting on the poles. <laughs> what do you need ice for anyway? Yeah, yeah. Drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I lost my place. What was I talking about? Uh, Continents. Chunk, chunk of land. Yeah, they all smashed together. And Pangea. Yeah. An epic sounding name. And, and there we are. And it's from pole to pole. That's important. Yes. So there's polar dinosaurs eventually, but we're not there yet. There's another edit for you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Good. I go. Towards the end of the Triassic, Laurasia, sort of the northern bit of Pangea, starts to break away from Gondwana. And we get a couple of uh, what uh, You can see the map. Have you looked at what them looked like during the beginning of that breakup? During the beginning? Well, the, the one map that um, is a kind of a stop motion, yeah. it, kind of, it, it, moved, it moves so fast, it's hard to, uh, to really follow uh, when what is happening. I mean, it's got it listed. So wow. no is what you're saying. I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Let, let me let me rephrase. I didn't pay enough attention. I, <laughs> sure, it, it looked really impressive. Yeah, but the uh, Pangaea was beginning to break apart during the Triassic, but it didn't actually break apart. Hmm. The uh, Triassic also ended with a mass extinction. <laughs> anyway, another yeah, stuff. Another chunk of stuff dying. Yeah. The Permian seems to have been associated with the Siberian traps. Big, fat, long, basaltic eruption, where the Earth just sort of dribbled out lava for hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> the, the end of the Triassic is associated with the what they call, hang on, I have to check my notes, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province is the Jeez. formation. Yeah, a camp for short. Okay. And that one was actually the biggest of this type of eruption. So it was a bigger eruption than happened in the Permian, but the die-off wasn't as bad. Strange. Yes. Well, a basaltic eruption, that's uh, more violent, isn't it? No, no. Actually, uh, basaltics, they dribble out. Okay, so I got it backwards. Yeah, hey. but uh, I did run into an article that was talking about the Siberian traps. They said as much as 20% of that eruption was explosive. I mean, these are categories. You don't necessarily get pure this or pure that when you're talking about volcanic eruptions. In fact, it's rare to get a pure kind, this kind of eruption. Mm. 
Now, you've looked more into geology than I have. You know this. Not on purpose, but yeah, they keep throwing it at me. Like the test question I got wrong is that the Atlantic is apparently the most uh, active area on the planet. Uh, volcanically, and, yeah, the uh, yeah. Mid-Atlantic Trench. Because they're separating, and so it's constantly doing volcanic stuff down there. But it it's is. not very impressive. That seems to have started towards the end of the Triassic, because that is where this formation is, right there on the Atlantic. It's on four different continents, North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. Hmm. More than 11 million square kilometers. So that was a big one. So does that mean that North America is going left? <laughs> Wait, sorry. Globe. Left. West. I meant west. West. <laughs> and actually, I don't know. I don't know which way the continents are going right now. Hmm. I know we're being subducted by the Juan de Fuca plate. Ah, yes, locally. Hmm. Another possible candidate for the extinction event was an asteroid impact. Um, oh, during the Triassic? Yeah, towards the end. Wait, did we say Triassic? Oh, <laughs> we've, we've covered <laughs> this issue in depth. I think we could probably move on. <laughs> I'm going to say it both ways. Yeah, yeah me too. So the yeah. Triassic die-off, uh, there are a couple of impact craters that are around the right time, but none that quite fit the bill. One of them's too small. One of them's about 10 million years early. Hmm. I ran into an article... They talked about these basaltic eruptions and how often they're associated with a die-off, either large or small, and how they are often associated with some impacts. And it suggested that the basaltic eruption happens on the opposite side of a major impact. So the shock oh. wave would travel around the Earth, converge on the other side, and crack open the crest, and then you've got several hundred thousand years of magma dribbling out and or exploding. Excuse me, um... I just had a thought about uh, if you put water in a bottle under the right circumstances and hit the top of it, uh, the bottom of the bottle will pop off. Oh. You think of our magma doing that. Yes. So, on much more impressive scales. There's a really large impact crater on Mercury. It takes up almost the whole front face. And on the opposite side of it, they have what they nicknamed the crazy territory. Huh. So you can see how the shockwave converged on the opposite side of the planet and just tore things up. I mean, I, it's part of me wants to be alive when something like this happens. No. The problem is I probably die while being all impressed about it. Yeah, there's a <laughs> lot amazing. of amazing events I'd like to see from a comfortably safe distance. <laughs> Another planet. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what happened with uh, life? during this time. And by the way, I found out there are still tree ferns in the universe, in this world. They're just not quite as impressive as they used to be. And nowhere near as ner uh, no, nah, nowhere near as numerous. Hmm. It was actually during the Triassic when conifers started taking over, the ancestors of what became pine trees. Oh, yeah. Go conifers. Yeah. I mean, they're all over the place now. They rule. I like the Triassic because it's when the reptiles did everything that mammals did later. This is when hmm. we get uh, the Ichiosaur. Oh. This is reptiles going back to the water. There are actually several of them. There are some things that uh, resemble the modern day sea iguana but are not related. There were uh, the Plesiosaurs, which uh, you've heard of, I'm sure. They're, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, you had long necks. Paddle feet. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, supposedly the Loch Ness Monster would be one of those. Yeah, he survived and he just hangs out in that lake. Yeah, it's, it's, true. it's a thing to do. <laughs> we also got the uh, the actual Ichiosaurs. Not, I shouldn't have mentioned them first, but the Ichiosaurs. Dolphin-like reptiles. Oh. Uh, but they swam oh. side to side as opposed to up and down. And they didn't have a single blowhole. They had uh, two nostril holes that had migrated up around where their eyes are. So they're on their way to being a dolphin, maybe. Uh, it's ish. They didn't, use, they didn't apparently use sonar either. They have uh, ridiculously huge eyes for the size of the animal. So it looks like they hunted exclusively with light. Wait, Not no, during the Triassic, but later they got to huge sizes. Some of them got up to 50 feet long. 
Another group we get are the Derosaurs, uh, commonly called pterodactyls, which is actually the name of one little species. Derosaurs, they were uh, the social uh, reptiles. They ran around to parties and, you know, got the social events going with dares. Okay, another edit right there. Sick. Blame the, okay, blame the cold medicine. Blame the cold medicine. The, well, let's just go ahead and call them pterodactyls because everybody else does. Pterodactyls are not the ancestors of birds. Okay, but they have wings. Yes, but they're not the ancestors of birds. They're not even dinosaurs. What? What? Yeah, I know. This surprised me. Now, no, this is the, this is the kind of definition that matters a lot to people who study dinosaurs and not much to, say, you or me. Um, yeah. The archosaurs, which became the dinosaurs, had many subgroups and had split off a number of times. Some of them split off to become... The plesiosaurs and the ichisaurs, the aquatic ones. Some of them split off to become the pterodactyl-like critters, the flying ones. And some of them eventually actually became the dinosaurs. Oh, that makes sense. Let's just try everything. Yeah. <laughs> I, that happens a lot with this whole evolution thing. <laughs> yeah, well, you it. When you uh, get to the ma- when we finally get to the mammals actually owning the earth, you're going to see dolphins. Doing the same thing, you're going to see sea otters and seals. Oh, yeah, there were reptilian seal-like critters. Ooh. I cannot remember the name of them, but they were interesting. That yeah. just seems like a nasty-looking critter. Yeah, and uh, just like seals, they can walk on land-ish. <laughs> I saw that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, the pterodactyl things, uh, much like bats. Mm. Um. Hollow bones? Oh, yeah. They did actually end up with hollow bones. Uh, bats. What else do the bats do? Echolocate. Oh. Doesn't seem like the reptilian branch did much of that, or even does much of that. I wonder if there are any uh, reptilian critters that echolocate. Hmm. It might be because of their ears. Which brings us to the early mammals. Oh. And the ears is one of the big things, one of our big advancements. Mm-hmm. And if you really want to follow this story, you got to go all the way back to the fish. Oh, gosh. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're all the way back to the fish and their very complicated jaws, uh, okay. including a second set of jaws inside the throat called pharyngeal jaws. Weird. So, yeah. Okay. And that's, so like, that's still true today. Most bony fish have a second set of jaws. So and they're not hinged. They're like sort of a... A circle with teeth pointing inward. So that's how they swallow? I mean, they have Yeah, yeah, mouths. that's exactly. Like, the outside mouth grabs and cuts. The inside one uh, grinds up and pulls towards the stomach. Huh. But a... all those bones, when we got on land, were kind of an issue because some, some of the jaw bones were helping hold up the brain case. And the ears were attached directly to the jaws. And at this oh. point, a lot of critters hadn't even invented an eardrum yet. And then some of, some of the bones in the skull start to fuse to add more support. And the weight got taken off one set of bones that migrated into the inner ear, called the stirrup now, the uh, oh. smallest bone in the human. Yeah, I've heard of that thing. Just because it has that, that fame. Ooh, look at how tiny I am. Then we get to uh, reptiles, and we get to the uh, cynodids, the ones that eventually became mammals. Mm. They started simplifying their jaws. Like reptiles right now, they have a couple of bones in their jaws that we don't. It's part of the reason why things like snakes can open their head to be like yeah. ten, swallow, swallow something like ten times bigger around than they are. Which is just not a good look. I mean, I'm glad we don't eat like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, those bones in mammals migrated... Da, 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 into the ear. Weird. Yes. Oh. So we actually have three little bones in our ears. During the uh, latter part of the Triassic, the archosaurs and dinosaurs started to take over niches that the uh, other, other critters that were related to the things that became mammals, the cynoids, had been taking, like large herbivore niches. Hmm. 
And it's thought that as the mammals were forced into smaller and smaller niches, a lot of the features that make us mammals happened. Like we needed to be better at controlling our temperature, so we came up with fur. We needed better senses, and so we get this amazing ear with these extra bones that gives us a better frequency range. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure we have a long enough episode now to just find some sort of coherent way to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Um, I did it. I did all this research and you haven't mentioned any of the, the stuff that I was thinking you would talk about. Like there's a therapsid. Oh yes. The therapsids. They had these big cheekbones and, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> they, uh, there's these squat little two ton. <laughs> squat little hyphen two ton. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. They're nine feet long and they're as much as two tons, but they look, they look cute. Like, uh, you know how reptiles have this long ass tail or the dinosaurs end up with this long ass balancing tail Yes. as kind of a feature. It looks like their tail is just, it's just there for show, slow going away. And it makes the thing look cute. Cute. Other than the face, the face. You know, the other thing you mentioned that was cute was like a three foot long cockroach that we talked about the other, or yeah. potato bug. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it seemed cuddly to me at the time. I mean, if you actually held one out to me, I would probably jump off the other end of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Where more of them are waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're way down there. Um, and Svenosuchia, the greyhound of the Triassic. Which is apparently one of the. Uh, they looked at its skull and they think that it was one of the early crocodiles, or on its way to being a crocodile. Oh yeah, and there's that. Uh, the amphibians had strikingly crocodile-like critters, apparently filling that niche, right? Mm -hmm. And then later, you get uh, other critters going. There was a reptile. Looks a lot like a crocodile. You go, oh, here come the crocodiles. Actually, no, they uh, that particular line died out, and that <laughs> niche was taken over by the crocodile. <laughs> Not only do you keep getting these body types for particular lifestyles showing up over and over again. This critter, I'm taking it. This is my slot. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the 50 foot long ocean going air breather. The Triassic is bloody fascinating, but uh, I mean, we don't have big dinosaurs yet. And no, we don't really get big dinosaurs until the Jurassic, but we can talk about that next time. See you then. Bye. Go ahead and copy the ones out right now. Bye. <laughs>